Ladies and gentlemen, we mentioned we have some special guests that will be joining uh, Nadine, and that is Haled Muzana, who is the producer. He's also did the score of the, of the movie, the music, and he has also collaborated on the screenplay. So Nadine and Haled, please welcome back. And with us tonight, we have Zayn, Zayn al Rafia. Please. Well, um, as I said at the beginning of the film, this was uh, the most extraordinary experience I had in Cannes. Uh, and absolutely the finest film that was there, and we're so honored to have you here. And I know, Zane, you've, you've gone through some changes recently, and are now living uh, someplace other than Lebanon. Is that correct? Yes, it's correct. Do you want me to ask him the question? Sure. I'm just asking a lot of things from the time of the film. Where did you start? Where did you start? What did you start with? I think it's a lot of things because كبرت سنتين وصرت ساكن بالنرويج وصرت عم روح على المدرسة وصرت عم تعلم لغة النرويجية. He said yes, it's true. My life has changed because first of all, I grew two years. I'm I'm two years older now, and I'm living in Norway, and I'm going to school, and I'm learning a new language. Yeah. Um, I think I, I'd like to ask you as the director, and you, Haled, as the producer, uh, and to talk about, uh, first of all, why was this film, you talked a little bit about the beginning, how important it was to you, but also how, why you decided to make it in this way. There are some things that are really different uh, from most films. Certainly this goes back to the Italian neo-realists, how they made films. Uh, non-professional actors, uh, shooting in chronological order, uh, so many different things. But this is a big decision, and I know for you as a producer, this must have been a challenge. So could you guys speak to that? Uh, yes, uh, especially that I, it, it was my first experience as a producer. I've never, I didn't know anything about producing a film before this one. So I'm a, I'm a music composer. But we knew while writing the film that no one would accept would have accepted to to, to make such a such a thing because we shot for six months. Uh, we we had two years of post production and editing. The the, the f we shot like six hundred hours of uh, of filming. The first version of the film was like fourteen hours. <laughs> so we're going to show that after the Q and A, <laughs> and I bet half of you would stay. So, uh, I mean, the only way to do it and to have the freedom to, uh, because we were de I mean, dealing with non-actors, with kids, and we knew that this would need time and a lot of, um, a lot of hours of shooting. So we decided to, I mean, we, uh, we put our home on mortgage and we, we run into the project. If you haven't guessed, uh, they are a couple. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Are you finding out about that. the refinance of the house for the first time now? <laughs> <laughs> it, it was, um, I mean, this, this is our, our a, a, a film made at home. It's a homemade film, really, in the real sense of the term. Uh, because we, you know, we, we live on the third floor, <laughs> and we decided to rent the first floor of our, in, in, in the building we live in, so we can start working on it, because my daughter at that at that point was like over uh, almost six or seven month old so I needed to be close to her and I was breastfeeding her at the same time this is why I, I, I the story was very uh, similar not similar but there was similar situations with Rahil's situation in the film also so anyway we, we decided that this was going to be a homemade film from the start with uh, and that we were going to 
impose the, our freedom uh, and not be not be clustered or, or boxed in the regular or, or, or classical way of making films. Uh, and that we, you know, if, if a scene doesn't work, uh, f you know, in one day, maybe it will work in a week. Mm. And, and knowing that we were going to be working with non-actors and children, we knew that we cannot ag ask a child to, to deliver what we need him to deliver when we, we need him to deliver it. We knew that we had to be much freer than that. We had to shoot longer. We had to be more patient. We had to be uh, sort of more observant than Im imposing our own ways of working. We had to adapt to their rhythm, to their personalities, uh, and not the other way around. So. So it was, and even everything, uh, the, the cinematographer lived on this first floor with the, and the editor of the film lived on the first floor. And, and, and during the whole edit, it was, a, it was a family affair, more than a regular way of, of making films. It was really something that we were doing on our own without anybody knowing even. Uh, and then it's, it was really when the film was finished that we started showing it to producers and investors. And I mean, some of the investors, of course, were coming along as uh, as we as we were uh, advancing in the process. But but the whole uh, you know the whole fairy tale happened really when the film was finished. Mm. Well, Halid, you said, I think I heard you say somewhere that you were a reluctant producer. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I didn't have any idea about how to, to make a film before. I mean, uh, what is the role of a producer? What is an executive producer? What is a, a line producer? What is uh, this? Uh, I discovered everything. I mean, for us, at the beginning, just like, let's, let's uh, bring two cameras and... Uh, and people who can take the sound and go and shoot. And it was much bigger than this. At the end, it ended with, with a lot of involving a lot of people and a lot of money. And um, yeah, it was, uh, I was, I, I learned on the front, I mean, while uh, doing the war. Um, and I had to write the music in the same time. So this was also a crazy thing to do, but because I, uh, I mean, I, I, my, my head was into all, all the problems, so I couldn't be artistically mm. uh, free, as free as possible to write. And, and the first version is 14 hours, and Nadine was telling me, where's the music? And the, where do you want me to start? How do you want me to score 14 hours? <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> Uh, that's a, yeah, a challenge to get your left and your right yeah, brain and, working. Yeah, uh, and the whole experience was for me, I mean, a life-threatening experience because it was either we succeeded, either it was a divorce. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yeah, so there was no place for failure in this project. So. <laughs> and and everything was mixed, you know. Uh, a lot of time Nadine used to tell me, I, I don't like the music here. I said, uh, I am the director, I don't like the music. I said, I am the producer, I like it. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> So uh, it it was but, very tough, yeah. yeah. But it just to uh, um, depart from from the pr production for a second for the music, that must have been a challenge too, because you know you're dealing with the, the everything is about reality, and we yeah. hopefully we'll talk more about that in casting. But for and how do you write music for this thing that is is uh, this film that is so much about reality and so much in the moment, and not and not to be manipulative because this film is anything but that. Uh, and but yet to make it work. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the music is an actor of a film, and how do you put an actor with non-actors? So I had to imagine things differently. I couldn't be manipulative. Uh, actually, I usually write music on the script, and I wrote a lot of themes on the script, but when I discovered the actors, when I discovered they in the places, I threw everything, uh, and I rewrote everything again. Because I, I mean, they, they, I, I, I didn't want to add something of myself to their truthfulness. So um, we ended up like uh, making a deal between Nadine and I. So we have places where are very realistic documentary, and places that were poetic, where the score had the place to to play. So we divided the film like this. 
Uh, but it was the balance was very hard to to reach, and I, I remember there was a day I, I I woke up just before we have to send the the the, the film to Cannes, and and I was so stressed that the music could could spoil this reality that I removed the whole score from the whole film, and I said Nadine, you send the film without the score. Uh, so we we were going through a roller coaster of uh, of. Um, of emotion regarding this, where to use the music, how to use it. We didn't want to be manipulative, and but we wanted also, I mean, to sh to, to to make people feel things, uh, especially at the end of the film. Uh, so that that was very hard. Well, it, it worked really well. Uh, obviously, the casting and choosing non-professional actors is a big, big part, and a big part in sense of how much time you put into the casting and working with the actors. So I want to take it back to Zane and ask uh, him what that experience was like uh, when you first got the notice you were going to read for this film. Um, he, he didn't really read for the film. We well, we, we, we conversation. Found him <laughs> the yes. first con first interview, yeah. uh, because we with the casting director of, um, was you know the whole team was going everywhere in Lebanon and and it was really street casting. So they were interviewing children and the parents and so she saw Zane hunting was down playing people on the hunting street. down people on the streets. This yeah. is how it goes. So uh, there were no editions really where right. people would come. So. Uh, I'm going to ask him how it felt okay. when he... Okay. So I'm going to ask you, the day that you knew that you were going to play the film, or the day that you saw us and we started to work on it, and we asked you questions, and we did an interview. What did you feel? What was the danger in your head in this day? The danger in my head is that I'm going to be famous, I'm going to be the world that you know. وقلت بعمل هالفيلم وبنبسط وتعرف على أصحاب وتعرفت على نادين وخالد وسارة وجينيفر. Okay, so so he said, well, um, I was asking him, so what did you feel the first day we met and we started talking about you being in film? He's 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 saying, uh, well, I thought that I should do it because maybe I would become famous. <laughs> And I will be an actor. And then I felt that I was going to meet interesting people. And I'm happy that I met Nadine and Khaled and Sarah, who's actually here uh, with us, and Jennifer, who's the casting director of the film. Oh, well, congratulations yes. to her. Yes, yeah. she's great. She's amazing. And the whole casting crew was just amazing. You know, when I was describing for them uh, all of the actors, because this is how it starts. So, you know, it starts with a meeting, and in the meeting I start um, giving them uh, a detailed brief of how I see uh, those characters. Who are they? And then I start describing them. And when I was describing Zane, that you know he's supposed to be smaller than his age because of malnutrition, uh, and he has to be, you know, he has to have those beautiful, uh, sad eyes that 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 say how much he's been through. He has to have this personality of those kids that you know uh, grow up on the streets and know nothing else but the streets and this foul language that they learn from the street and this character and. Uh, I was I was talking and talking and in my head I was thinking, I'm asking them for a miracle. We're they, we're never gonna fi find Zane in life. We're never gonna find Jonas. I'm never gonna find a small child who's about almost one years old, about to make his first steps, be very receptive and very very aware. And 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 I was imagining those scenes that we had written. And in my head I was saying it's impossible. How am I gonna ask? children to do what I'm asking them to do in the film. And, and it was like this for every character while I was describing them. But, I mean, miracles happened. Uh, and yeah. we really found Apparently, them yeah. in, in, in life. And, and I'm, I'm so lucky to have, you know, t that I was able to discover them and to work with them because they nurtured me and they taught me so, so, so much every, every day of this amazing adventure. Uh, could you ask Zane, was it, was it a, a fun experience for him? And uh, he seems obviously to be such a, a natural actor. And I know 
Uh, a lot of it is visual, a lot of it is uh, reacting, and others is his stories, but it's always, I see poetry in there, and I don't think uh, that happens very often in this situation. Do you want me to ask him if he had sure. fun? Zain, I'm going to ask you, how did you get to the end of the story? How did you get to the end of the story? I got to the end of the story, and I was going to the end of the story. وحتى كنا أك... من بعد ما نخلص مشهد يا يعني نضحك يا يعني نلعب مع بعض يا يعني نتسلى. He said he was having a lot of fun and because he met us he was very happy to meet all of the crew in the film and he said that he was he was having fun because after each scene he was you know Zayn is very farceur uh, how do you say farceur he is uh, he likes to play tricks on people the whole time they, I think the the uh, you and everybody that was with us uh, during you know those two last hours know how much Uh, Zayn likes to play tricks, so so he w he used to play tricks the whole time on with with the crew. So so everybody really he was he was having fun. He, he didn't take it very very I think seriously, and he said he was having fun. Could you also also ask him because uh, he's been referred to as a pint-sized James Dean? Has he ever seen James <laughs> Dean's movies? That <laughs> mean James Dean? No. <laughs> He doesn't know who James Dean is. <laughs> It's a compliment. <laughs> James Dean was a very famous actor and was very nice and very nice. He had a very nice personality and he was very nice. And now what's going on? He's asking what happened to him now. Uh, <laughs> should we tell him? <laughs> Maybe we should talk about this later. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about this later. <laughs> I think we went down, I went down a rabbit <laughs> hole on <laughs> this <laughs> one. <laughs> You should have said Tom Cruise or something. <laughs> <laughs> Even I don't know if he knows he Tom Cruise. He became very famous. Tell me Tom Cruise. Come on, look. He doesn't know who Tom Cruise is either. Um, uh, I mean, long as we're on the the acting part, I mean, just some of the there's so many great scenes. I mean, Dane. Uh, Zane, <laughs> now James Dane, Dane Dean. Uh, Zane uh, with his sister. Actually, oh my God. Zayn Adin. Yeah. Yeah. Zayn Al Abidin. No, Zayn Al Abidin. Zayn Al Abidin. Okay. Al Abidin. Yes, yes. So, uh, with his sister, uh, those are just some of the most poignant scenes uh, and intense scenes I've seen. Could you kind of discuss, say, use an example? That is an example of. So many great scenes with the baby, and and uh, just every character was really uh, there in the moment. I think the the thing that helped me the most, I think, in this whole process was the fact that each actor, even if they're not actors, I'm going to call them actors anyway, were was sort of feeling that they were part of the mission. Hmm part of this collaboration and this m mission of telling their story and being the voice of those people that they were representing. And this is how they really drew their, their energy and their force because they've never, you know, they've never acted in their lives. So in the beginning, they were very scared. They were a bit paralyzed in this whole process because, and so slowly and And the time that we spent together really helped. That's why it was so important to spend so much time. It helped them understand how important what they had to say was. Because until then, they were struggling to even prove they exist in real life. Nobody listens to them. Nobody listens to their problems. Nobody listens to their struggle. Nobody sees their struggle. All of a sudden, they feel like what they have to say is important, and that they, the there's the struggle that they have that they have in their real life, and the fact that they're representing the struggle of all those people that they are they're being um, they represent they're representing actually gave them a lot of strength. Mm. It gives the, it gave them wings, and it was it was slowly the process slowly started. Uh, all of a sudden becoming their also personal mission and their personal struggle. So when they are 
um, trying to work on a, on, on a scene, it's not only something that is imposed on, on them, it's something that they collaborate in. Mm. So this really helped me a lot because some of the scenes were very difficult to do. And, you know, we spent days doing them. It's not um, something that happened very quickly. And the first shot or the first take was always very bad. It used to go into so many directions and sometimes we were wondering what we were doing and we'll never get there and, and it was very difficult. But take after take after take, they start understanding what they're doing and what is what the mission of that scene is. And sometimes they would come and tell me, no, I, I, I need to do it one more time. I, I think I can, here I can, I, can, I can do this better. I can say this in a, in a, in a better way. So I think this helped me a lot. It was also their struggle. So, so when they are standing in front of the judge and talking, it was actually for them, it was their only chance in life to stand in front of justice and just shout out what they feel every day and talk about their struggle in front of a real judge because the judge is a, is a real judge. And so they, they took it as if it was their only chance to really express all their anger towards that system that keeps excluding them and keeps uh, marginalizing them. So everything was about that. And this was really um, a life-changing experience for us too because you, you have the feeling that this is not just a film. This is, we're talking about real struggles, we're talking about real people, and when you're watching the film knowing that, I don't, I think that you somehow are changed forever because you know that you're walking, okay, you're walking past those doors, but you know that those people that were, that you were watching for two hours, they, 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 this is their struggle in their real life. And you know that you're gonna go sleep in a warm bed, but they're having the same struggle every single day to even prove that you know they exist. So it was, I think it was the same thing for us also as a crew, knowing that we were because we were shooting in inside their lives. We were shooting in the real location and in in those real slums. We were shooting sometimes, you know, in the sewers. We're walking in the sewers and the gutter. They they are practic they are realistically this is it. You you smell this you smell the the the, the sewers. You you hear the babies crying all the time. You you are in it. But then you leave the shoot and you go and you sleep in a warm bed. And you're not the same anymore. You, you can't sleep the same way anymore. It's impossible. When you know that you left them there and you're going to go back the next day to live that same life again with them. I, I, I think cinema has a, has, a, has a big mission when it is um, humanizing you know, some problems that we hear about in the news. We, 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 talk, we hear about them in figures, in numbers, in statistics. But when you put a face to the struggle and when you really see it, it's a completely different, I think, um, impact it has on you. Yes. Um, I think obviously for you and the cast and everybody, but for the audience too, I think it was Roger Ebert who said that film is an empathy machine. Absolutely. And, uh, that's, and this is a powerful machine here. Why don't we open it up for questions from the audience? Oh, I see we have a few. <laughs> All right, let's start over here. Congratulations on a great film. Thank you. Uh, this is sort of a question for Zane. I'm not surprised that the process sounded like it was fun for him, but I'm also curious, were there things that were difficult for him to do, either from a technical standpoint or more importantly, an emotional standpoint? And please tell him what a great job he did as an actor, too. OK, I will. I don't know if he's going to elaborate so much, but I can also yeah. add to it. But I'm going to ask you what the most difficult thing you can do in the film. And I'm going to ask you that you're a great actor. And I'm going to ask you what the most شو كان أصعب شيء تمثله بالفيلم؟ شو كانت أصعب مشاهد لإلك؟ إذا تأثرت 
بصراحة أنا ولا شيء بيكون صعب علي خص نص أي شيء بحطه براسي يعني حطيت أعمل الفيلم براسي وعملته يعني ما في شيء صعب <laughs> he says nothing was difficult for him <laughs> as long as he as long as he put it in his mind that he was going to do it he was able to do it um, I, I'm going to elaborate a little bit on that and tell you how we were working uh, on set with with Zane Zane uh, I don't know if you know but uh, I, I sort of told you a little bit in the beginning that he comes from almost the same background. So Zayn in real life is a Syrian refugee. In the film he doesn't play the role of a Syrian refugee, but in, in life he has he has almost you know the same continuous struggle every day on the streets. He, the only difference from the film is that he has loving parents, which is great. But but still Zayn didn't go to school. He for him, you know, the streets were his school. He he learned everything there and that's how that's why he's so wise. That's how he he almost lost his childhood because he's seen a lot. And, and I, I, I used to understand it slowly while we were talking and shooting and in those moments where he used to tell me things without really wanting to tell me. But I know Zane has, Zain has seen a lot of abuse. He's seen a lot of children being abused, a lot of children being beaten up. He's seen a lot of injustice towards children. He's seen children who were married at 11, 12 years old. So he felt that he was also, in a way, talking in the name of those children. He was being their voice. Mm -hmm. And a lot of time he would, he was expressing things that he was, he either saw or, or experienced himself or saw other kids experience it. And this gave him also a lot of strength because he felt he was part of the mission. You know that scene where he's speaking on the phone to the TV show and he's saying, life is worse than the shoe I'm wearing. Life is hell. I feel like I'm r being roasted like the chicken I long to eat. What am I going to remember later? The beatings or the hose. Uh, I never hear a nice word. These are things I pushed him towards saying, not I pushed him towards saying it, but I pushed him towards expressing himself towards the life that he has. And these are the words that he said. So you can understand how much he knew the life that we were talking about in the film. So this was also, he felt part of the mission in a way, and he used to tell me things about those children, and he used to be very angry sometimes. So it, I didn't feel it was also imposed on him as a reality. He was really uh, defending those children. There was, uh, how about, um, is there a woman here who has a question? <laughs> no? All right. The, uh, over here, the gentleman. Yes, Zane's parents are with him in, in Norway. Or his parents, his siblings, everybody's going to school, in, including the parents, to know to learn the language and to adapt. Um, uh, regarding the reaction in Lebanon, has been very positive. Positive. I don't. I can't. I don't know if we should call it positive, but it's it's sh a bit shocking to f to to some people because uh, they've. They're, now they they see something they've, mm, in a way, denied for a long time because this is what we usually do. We don't want to see the reality and we just keep going and we tend not to look. Maybe we maybe we don't see it, but it, the film was showing it really, and it was a it's a magnifying glass on all those problems. So it's a bit of a shock. For, for Lebanese people, but it's a positive shock because all we hear is we need to do something, we need to change, we need to wake up to, to the fact we can't stay silent anymore. 
And what we're planning on doing right after we finish the tour and, and, and all the traveling is really organize screenings for the government, for the different ministries, Ministry of Justice, of Social Affairs, uh, the, the, the judge, juvenile judges, the different NGOs that work on children's rights. And we're, this is what we should start doing, is really open the debate and organize roundtable and talk and share our, our experiences and share our expectations. Because during those four years, We've seen the failures of the system f from many different angles. And, and it's, there's, a lot, there's a lot to do on many levels. And we can only, I think, do things better by really talking to each other and, and just sharing our own experiences and, and really talking about it. I want to just interject something because you, you touched upon a couple of things here that each one of these actors actually had something similar going on and these things are amazing. But also when you talk further about what the needs are, uh, I understand you're making a documentary about the people who were in the film, how their lives have changed, if at all, and developing a foundation as well. Yes, absolutely. We're, we're, we're doing a documentary about um, also following uh, all the actors' lives later, because each one uh, is, each, 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 each situation is changing a little bit. Uh, in Zane's case, uh, now Zane is resettled in Norway. He has a completely different life. Uh, in uh, a Treasure, uh, y y sorry, Jonas in real life is actually a girl, and her name is Treasure, <laughs> yes. And she's now living in Kenya. Uh, she's going to school, too. Uh, we're trying to work on the other families and the other children of the film. And this year, they all need to be in school, uh, even though none of them have ever been to school. So we need to find accelerated uh, programs, uh, learning programs for them so they can they are able to enroll in schools, uh, in normal schools later on. So, and And the fact that during the film, there, there was, you know, reality and fiction kept bumping into each other the whole time. So there's so many stories that need to be told about how uh, Rahil got arrested in real life two, two days after we shot those scenes where she gets arrested. She gets arrested in real life. And she goes through the exact same thing. And, and, and Jonas's par treasure's parents get arrested with Rahel because during the shoot they became friends. So they were at a party together and, and there was a raid and, and, and they got caught, all of them, three of them, because they didn't have papers. They're living illegally in Lebanon. So when we were shooting those scenes with Treasure without her mother in, 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 in the film, she was, she was actually without her mother in real life. So it's... Every, there was so many stories like that in the film, so that's that's what we need to talk about in in this documentary. How this is not uh, this was real life that we were working with, and also we are doing a, this foundation. So we are we're trying because you know we need help, and and we 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 need help for for those families. We need so yes, we're trying to gather some funding to be able to maybe change in a way. It's not, we're not gonna have ideal situations, but maybe um, somehow a better situation for each one. In Zane's case, it's like a fairy tale. You know, if you, if you see Zane's house now, it's like, it's a fairy tale. He has a two-story house overlooking the sea. Uh, he, he, they have a garden. He, he actually is playing in his garden. He's not playing on the street with garbage and, and knives. And uh, it's a completely shift of, of uh, it's a complete shift of destiny. And and it's amazing what's happening. It is amazing. And uh, Halid, I guess you have a new URL too, don't you? A new what? URL, a new uh, website going ah. up. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, like uh, CapernaumFoundation.org. Uh, so, if anyone wants to to help or to contact, uh, I mean, we will be available there. Great, yeah. thank you. Questions? The woman right here in.
Can everyone hear that question? Uh, she was asking how, how did the research process uh, uh, happen and, and how, how did they trust me? Um, it, it was much more simple than we think. Uh, and it was, for me, it was really going there, just uh, talking to people, uh, trying to understand, uh, trying to have some kind of... I used to go to several NGOs that work with uh, those communities, that help those communities. I used to go with the social worker that works in this NGO, uh, go with her in those houses, see how she works, see how she... Um, how, how does she help and what do they need? Uh, talk to them very, very clearly, no, you know, very simply. And it's really, it's what you reflect that, that helps you. It, the, the, every, everybody was trusting very quickly because they knew there was something there. They knew there was, they needed to express themselves uh, and there was somebody there to listen to their problems, to listen to what they were going through. Um, and it was very simple. I used to also go and spend hours in courts simply by going to courts and sitting like, you know, any, any person who wants to uh, watch any court. And I used to spend hours there just watching, observing how it happens, how does the justice system work, uh, how, how does it, uh, you know, how does it usually work? And, and that's it. For me, it was very simple. It was not, it was, the approach was very simple. And that's why I think people trust you very quickly. Because there's, you're transparent. There's nothing to, to hide. You just want to learn. You just want to uh, understand why. And, and this is how, 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 it, how it happened. At the end of the four years, I had met every single Judge, juvenile judge, every single lawyer. I've met, been to every single NGO. I've, I've been to uh, the juvenile prisons. I've been to the detention centers, spoke to the children, spoke to the uh, social workers, understood the parents, uh, understood the problems from so many different angles. But it was at the beginning, I thought, how am I going to start? How does it work? Where do I start from? But then it's much simpler than we think. One person would lead me to another person who would take me to places, and and that's how it ha that's how it happened. Uh, and and people d don't necessarily recognize me quickly because it was. Uh, and then later on, they knew who I was and they knew why I was doing it, and they would open up and they would tell me stories because they knew that I wanted to tell their story. And they knew that they wanted to express it, and they've been maybe waiting for it, for, for it for, to express it in a way. So it was simple. Yes, over there. Ah, <laughs> thank you. Uh, well, I, I guess we have time for like I'm going to ask the last question: Who took care of treasure? In the film? No, after, uh, in real life, when uh, her mother was arrested. Ah, the casting director took her home. Okay, is she yes, here? Yes, and she was, <laughs> no, she's not yeah. here, unfortunately. And she was, uh, you know, she, we were, in a way, her family for three weeks, uh, and, uh, and the casting director took her home, and she was sleeping at her house every night after the shoot. And we were, it was very also difficult emotionally to shoot those scenes knowing that her mother was, was not actually there. Um, and we were able to, to free her parents uh, on the night of Christmas. So we took her as a surprise to jail and they left jail with her uh, Christmas on Christmas night. So this was a beautiful moment that we'll never forget. 
Well, there, there's uh, just so many stories of, of each and individual character in the movie and what happened and what you did for them, but I guess we'll just have to wait and see the documentary. <laughs> but I want to thank you for your Herculean work here. Thank you. But even more important, the humanity that you brought to everybody involved and the sense of hope and urgency to this incredible, incredible uh, uh, issue we have to deal with. There's no avoiding it. So yeah, thank I you. just wanted to say that sure. the refugee problem is the global problem. And in front of this problem, you have two choices. Either you help or you build the wall. And building walls has n never saved any civilization. It never saved the Roman Empire. It never saved the Byzantine Empire. It didn't save the Soviet Union. When a civilization starts building a war, this is its end. And I'm proud of, I mean, I come from a country of three million people. We have one million and a half Syrian refugees. And we call them refugees. So uh, 6,000 people coming here, some people call them an invasion. So let's, I mean, let's, uh, it's, it's, it's all, let's be more human and put more humanity in politics. Uh. Thank you. Thank you all for coming here with this fantastic movie from so far away, from Norway, from Lebanon, with the lack of sleep. He's jet lagged. <laughs> We're all jet lagged. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank, Thank you. you.